Welcome to the Inspired Speaker Series. Today we have a very special guest for you. We have Phil Walker, formerly Chief Operating Officer of Capgemini, the global consultancy. But guess what? Philip started his career as a teacher, then a consultant, now a leader, now an entrepreneur. The big lesson for today is you do have to have a dream of where you want to be, but don't make it so rigid that you can't flex along the way. This is a story of inherent flexibility, identifying opportunities, and backing himself at every turn. This will be a masterclass. Thank you. This is the second in our Inspired Speaker series. What we're hoping to achieve here is to bring people from industry who have sat where you've sat and who are going to share their journey. We're very lucky, very privileged to have Phil Walker as our guest. If I think about where Phil started, he started in education. He was a teacher. Where he ended up, he was leading a series of the biggest global consultancies on the planet. And one of the lessons we learn from there is, especially in our constantly changing world, it's not about where you start, it's about where you want to get to. Phil, welcome. Thank you, Rennie. What do you do at the moment? Uh, at the moment, I run uh, my own small niche advisory firm. Uh, and we specialize in improving the productivity of certain firms. Um, if a firm comes to us and says they want 2% improvement in performance, that's not of interest to me or any of my colleagues. If they say they want 30 or 40% improvement, then we're interested. So it's big change stuff, but niche. To be able to advise companies, consulting firms to grow at that level, you must have been around a bit. Uh, been around a little bit, so as you alluded to, I've had 20 years in this particular business. But I think it's quite important to define what consulting is Please. or is not. Can I just have a show of hands, first of all, of how many of you want to be a consultant? One, two, three. Oh, at least yes. more than 50% of the people in the room. So I'm going to be asked a number of questions. It's quite important that I set the context of what consulting is and is not. Consulting in the UK is six billion alone. I would argue that most of that six billion is not consulting. Let me just define consulting for you, if I may, and bear in mind that your own organization has a link with the very first consultancy that was formed called Arthur D. Little, 1898. So in every culture and in every society, be it in uh, the UK or US or, or anywhere in the world, has been the wise person in the village that you go to. In Greek mythology, you would call it the oracle. In African mythology, you would call it the dogon. So there's been the wise person from time dot that you would go to to seek advice. Two key things about that advice. You go to advice on the big things. Not should I go shopping today? Should I go to war? Should I have another six children? Should I get married? Big things. You go to the dogon for serious advice. But here's the rub. The oracle or the dogon or the advisor won't just give you the answer, it's 42, or it's on Tuesday. The advisor will always set you a riddle or a bit of work to do. Why would they do that? Absolutely right. Give this person a star. <laughs> to make Consulting. you feel involved. <laughs> Consulting without engagement without work is nothing. So I'd like you to bear that picture in mind as Rennie prepares his next question in terms of the nature of consulting in the 21st century. Now you've explained that so clearly and so well, what attracted you to consulting? Um, I had, uh, as you alluded to, it, I'd had a, uh, uh, a high profile sales career both in Xerox where I was uh, uh, a successful salesperson. I then worked for Michael Dell 20 years ago, setting up uh, Dell Consulting across the UK, and that was in a very exciting time. Uh, made a little bit of money, and I started writing. In those days, it was a very odd thing to do to sell on the phone. So I started writing about why, why is it that people are trusting Michael Dell with their money on the assumption and the promise that something would be delivered in five days later. So I was fascinated about what was at that time called customer relationship management. I started writing about it. 
a gentleman who you know called John Moynihan saw some of my articles and said, come and be a consultant at PA Consulting. I said, I don't know what one of those is, but uh, he said, well, we'll train you, and uh, I enjoyed it, and the rest was history. From, he, he could see that you could write a decent article on about a really gripping subject. How did he know you could consult? I think at the essence of consulting, if you have the, the confidence, confidence balanced with humility to offer advice, um, it, it's, it's predicated on the fact that you have something to say. This is hugely important for all of those hands that went up and said, I want to be in consulting. The debate is, what do you believe in and what are you going to say? And if you believe in something, are you confident enough to put that in writing and publish it? In the industry, we call it thought leadership. Well, most of the stuff out there is not thought leadership. It's copied stuff out of a book. So what do you believe in? What is your proposition that you're going to put to the market? What would you advise somebody on? So you come into PA Consulting, and John Moynihan, who is the chairman, yep. is quite a hard-nosed businessman. What did you consult on initially, and why? Uh, initially, it was based on the, my Xerox and Dell experience, and it was asking the question, why do customers do the things they do? Uh, and you've got a, a, a huge retail experience, Rene, and it's quite complex. Human beings do, do different things at different times. If you recall, about uh, 15 years ago, there was a lot of software about customers. Siebel, recently bought by SAP, and the, the thinking was that if you installed this wonderful software, customers would flock to your desk. Currently, it's all about big data. So the proposition at the moment, if you install these big data systems, customers will flock to your desk. I think it's slightly more complex. I think it always was more complex. Just because a customer wants a rum and coke on a flight to Barbados um, on, on a Monday, uh, second time around, they may not want the same thing. So the complexity of how to treat customers is still a topic that fascinates me. And I think I managed to convince uh, John Moynihan that that was a topic I was interested in and that I had something to say. So, we get that. You have a domain, you become well-versed in it, you have the confidence, a bit of humility. What progresses you up to the top of a consulting business? Firstly, uh, clients articulating the value that you deliver. So this is a slightly different industry where putting your hand up and saying, look at me, uh, that the converse is true. It will be clients putting their hand up saying, I recognize what Rene has done today. And that's slightly different from most other industries that you might be tempted into. So the, the, if you like, the groundswell of opinion coming from clients back into the firm helped me progress through my career. So you move on from PA Consulting. What did you do next? Uh, I, I ran uh, PA Consulting's customer relationship practice. I was then asked by IBM to set up their European CRM practice. So asked to set up, how do you set up a practice in consulting? Well, I, th I think you lay down the, the proposition of why you are there. This is quite important to attract the right people. You need to articulate why you are there. Um, then you go out and you get some great people, and then you go out and win some work. You make it sound very simple. Uh, it's quite hard. It's quite hard to do. It is a competitive environment, as you alluded to. Um, it was 1898 with Arthur Doolittle. Uh, the, the next guys on the block were Booz. Interesting, some of these names who aren't around anymore. In 1914, um, I sound as if I was there, but I wasn't. In 1914, <laughs> um, McKinsey uh, set up, set up their, their practice. In those early days, it was about scientific measurement. The word management wasn't used. It was scientific measurement. Booz introduced the concept of, of management at that time. And the first uh, consulting projects were around the banking sector in the 1930s. This is quite an important history if you plan to jump into this, this particular sector. And we know that the audit firms jumped into this uh, uh, morass uh, in the 1990s and got kicked out again post the Enron scandal. The balance between consulting and, and audit was deemed not a particularly clever thing to do. So it's quite an interesting uh, sector in terms of the bow ways and peaks and troughs of what works and what doesn't work. So there's the, the trick of being one of the better consultants. Now you're leading consultants. Yep. And you're not necessarily as focused on the client as you were before. 
What's the attributes and competences and capabilities one needs to move to the leadership level of a consulting practice? Okay, it's a great question because one of the things that happens in not just consulting but in most businesses, and it's a bit schizophrenic, is that you struggle to make partner. Partner is where the money is and obscene bonuses that dominate the city and you read about. So we're talking about that world. We will come back to that. We're talking about that world of obscene bonuses. So, so enjoy <laughs> for a second. Um, but the irony of the, the climb up the greasy pole to a partner is that when you're nominating somebody to be a partner who's totally focused on becoming a partner, the irony is as they become a partner, their whole focus needs to change from themselves back to the team. That is the only way to grow a practice. And you've had some, some great CEOs sitting on this particular platform, and they will all talk about motivating and building great teams. And consulting, uh, that is even more the case, because as I said, they, are, they sit behind the client. Some of the great projects that are going on out in the city right now, you will never hear about. And that's, that's rightly so, uh, because it is the client at the forefront and the consultant takes the back seat. So it's about building great teams, uh, Rene, as in, as, in any, as in any business. So you're building a great team, hypothetically. What do you look for? What, what do you constitute that potential to be a great consultant? What are the two or three things you look for? Firstly, um, you need you know, at least a foundation of a, of a good education. You know, that, that's just, a, that's just a, a condition of entry. I also look to somebody who's been in the real world. And what I mean by the real world is in industry. I think it's rather difficult to leave a business school and stand in front of a CEO and say, I'm your consultant. I mean, that, that, that does happen in a couple of uh, practices. I don't think that's particularly wise. I also look for somebody whose career may have taken a little dip, who may have done something different. Because this industry is quite tough, I like people who perhaps have had a little failure somewhere in their career. The reason I like that is because I've seen instances where, and I'm going to use a cliche here, Please. and I apologize if Please. this insults everybody, but I'm sure we're all friends here. Uh, there are people, if you like, mummy and daddy have bought them an education. They've had nothing but success all through their life. A client gives them a hard Not time. Not at this business school, yeah, Absolutely. Actually. A client gives them a hard time on a project, and they collapse and they can't cope. You know, I need people who've just had perhaps a little edge, a little failure sometime. They've tried something. They've run a business, perhaps, tried a business, and failed, and tried again. Those are characteristics that I look for. They've worked in a charity, they're doing something in a local church, or they're doing something in the community. Something slightly more selfless rather than selfish. Because those are some of the attributes when you're out in Scotland running a project on a cold night. You need those fundamental strengths and attributes and selflessness that take you through to the next day. What's been your toughest moment as a consultant? Toughest moment as a consultant, I was running a project in um, Sweden. I thought I was really good. And um, as you do, there's a lot of presentations that one does. I, I, am, I think I'm reasonably good at presentations. And at the end of the presentation, the client reminded me that uh, from a cultural perspective, uh, in Sweden you talk less, you listen for the first meeting, you shut up. And then if they like you, they invite you back and then you can do the presentation. So that was a big learning curve Did for me. Did you win me. the contract? For, no. That was a big <laughs> learning curve for me. <laughs> Having worked in Barbados and Africa and Russia uh, and in the US, you know, I needed to slap myself around the head and remind myself that to take on board some of the cultural nuances of the places um, where you could be consulting. I mean, the plus side of consulting is, you know, you can be in London on Monday and South Africa on Tuesday. I mean, th there are some pluses, as Rene will tell you. PA Consulting was a pure consultancy. Yep. IBM had its big services practice, its hardware practice, and a consulting. Does that matter? If, you're if you want to be a consultant, is it better or does it just doesn't matter? Pure consulting or...? <coughs> it's, a great, it's, a, it's a great question. The industry, um, as I mentioned, is six billion just in the UK alone. And it's probably morphing into three areas which are causing confusion if you plan this for your career. They're, they're the guys who I would call think, i.e. strategy, just pure play strategy, the McKinsey's and Baines. So there are another group of people that I would call build. Um, and I was sitting with the head of SAP, and they have a consulting practice, but we know they deliver software. And the third element is outsourcing, where we'll run stuff for you. 
Now, given the analogy and the story I told you about consulting, I think consulting as a sector is shrinking. But people who call themselves consulting, it's a huge landscape. As you know, IBM sells stuff, hardware and software and whatever. So the term consulting is being spread rather thin. Why? Why? Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a nice title to have on your mm. business card. Mm. I am a consultant, so you too could leave this building tomorrow and go out and say, we're consultants. There's no regulation. I sit on the management consulting board of the UK. We're trying to, to inculcate and put in place some type of regulation because it's unregulated at the moment. So two men and a dog or two women and a cat can say, we're setting up a consultant tomorrow and off you go. Um, but I go back to the original um, metaphor I used of the wise person. If you are going into a, an organization and uh, painting the building, I think you're a painter rather than a consultant. And there are a lot of organizations in there going, installing some software, um, and there are electricians and software engineers. That's what they are. I don't think it's consulting. Aren't but that's snobbish? my personal Aren't view. Are you just being snobbish? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. And the reason is, if we, if, we, if we blur these lines, the value is denuded. And what you're seeing, you're seeing a schism between the top-end consulting, where the rates are always high, and the bottom-end consulting, where the rates are continually being driven downwards. And, and when you're managing a practice, this is something you're managing all the time. The tension between how much do I charge today, what is my utilisation, have I got people busy? And you're seeing rates being continually driven down by people who are usually installing kit or whatever um, and can afford to drive the rates down. A and another example would be if you are in somebody's building, and you'll hear people say this, I've been working in company X for a year. I don't think you're consulting. I think you're temping. This is quite an important delineation because you will have friends who are working on a project and they'll say, I've been, working, I've been working with Rennie for a year. Well, that's almost like a relationship. Are you really consulting? What are you doing? Maybe they're are just you really good consultants. They just get, their yeah. contracts get renewed, get renewed, get renewed. Mm, may, maybe, Rene, but you'll find that 70% that of those long-term contracts are business process re-engineering, or software implementation or hardware implementation, and that is what we should call their them. Their jobs. Their jobs. Yes. And, 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 and this is very important just from your intellectual positioning. The great consultants are there for a short time, delivering huge amounts of value, charging whatever they like, and then you get out. This is really important. When you have a thousand people in a firm, you have a propensity to say, let's keep them there as long as we can. That's not always a good thing. So, you've, you're now, you've done IBM. Yep. What happens next? Um, I get a call from Capgemini saying, um, rather than run one practice, would you like to run our 10 practices? And I said yes. Um, what did they see in you, Phil? From um, 1 to 10, what did they see? Okay. I, 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 th I, I flatter myself by saying, I think they saw a people person. I think they saw uh, somebody who could motivate people to go to various parts of the world, do the right thing and come back. And we also had a lot of fun. We were based in um, Wardour Street in Soho. That's a fun place to be. So we're in Ronnie Scott's. I don't want to give you the impression it's all work. <laughs> so Ronnie Scott's once a fortnight. You know that landscape. I know the landscape. It's full of wine bars. I and, know and if you can't party <laughs> as a consultant, then you know, you're missing the trick. What's in... <laughs> What's interesting about how you describe you and what Cap Jones, I do get it, yes. is there was no mention of consulting skill per se. There was no sort of subject matter expertise. What they saw was good with people, can motivate, can make things happen. Yeah, and, 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 and that's an interesting point you make. Um, in a previous meeting I've just had, somebody asked me what were the skill sets. That there are certain things that you can learn. You can learn a bit about supply chain. If you are rubbish with people, there's not a lot I can do. I mean, if you just don't like people, there's not much we can do about that. If you can't communicate... So you may as well just leave now, if you, then. <laughs> if you can't communicate, there's not much we can do. If you are bad, as I gave an example of my failure, with cultural nuances, then there's not much I can do. The rest can be trained. The rest really can be trained. This is a hell of a point here. It's a huge point. So when you're looking for people to come into your practice, 
Will you take them if they're thought leaders, if they're built, if they run, but they don't have the people skills? No. Why? No. Because your business is in front of people. Your, 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 your primary business, particularly if you're leading a project, your primary business will be in front of people. I fully accept the fact that maybe somebody who is brilliant at coding but bad people skills. But as per my pre previous question, I don't think doing coding all week is consulting. I think that's something else. I think that's IT and I think it's engineering. But the people skills are absolute. What you're doing and what you do every day of the week, Rene, is you, you tell stories with content. You make people do some work and they learn from your interaction. That's consulting. And it's quite important to get that differentiation between um, the ability to tell a story, the ability to impart some knowledge and work with a client. They learn by working with you. Just telling them the number's 42, it, 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 they may forget it and they certainly won't value it. Okay? If you make them work for the particular answer, you can charge whatever you like and they will remember that lesson forever. And that's genuine value. You've gone from one practice to ten practices. What, yep. what was your biggest learning? Um, <clears throat> my biggest learning was that in order to run, and this is with 30 vice presidents and a staff of 650, Probably my biggest learning was to put in place a dashboard. A dashboard of the business. Something Tesco's did back in the day, you know, when everyone was raving about them. Um, because I felt that understanding the business, most businesses look at their P&L a month after the event. So they have the weekly meeting or the monthly meeting, and they say, how did we do this month? Oh, we lost some money. For me, that was always a bit late. And I wanted to sit, and it's not that complex. I wanted to know... What are my clients saying today? What are my uh, internal people saying today? What's my utilization today? What's the profitability today? So I could have it on my PC and have it on the dashboard. There's a phrase I used in, in uh, Capital. Any of you fly planes? Any you fly pilot? No, fly plane? Great. So there's a phrase called flying straight and level. So if you trim a plane and it's flying straight, it will fly itself, right? It will, just, it will just keep level and it will fly itself. So if you can get your business flying itself with the gauges at the right level, you can get back to doing what you're good at, which is being in front of a client. So my biggest takeaway was get the business flying straight and level. Look at the dials today. There's a huge danger in Western economies with businesses looking at events that have happened as opposed to events that are happening and events that could be happening and looking forward. It's a huge issue and it's a another debate altogether. But my biggest takeaway was looking at, looking at the, the business dials today and making decisions almost in real time. It's huge. Now, this leads us to a really interesting point about consulting. In a world that's changing so fast, so yep. rapidly, how do consultants keep up to speed, finger on the pulse, in a world that's so rapidly changing as we're living in today? Okay, it's a great question because the, the, the great firms uh, take time out. So if you say you've been working on a project for a month or whatever, you, you can take a week out to refresh and get up to speed with some of the dynamics um, that are going on. I was on a course last Monday called Women in Leadership at Windsor Castle. I know I'm not a woman, but I was invited to the course. And it was absolutely fascinating in terms of some of the dynamics that are going on in terms of um, getting more women onto the boards of the UK. And I know you're involved in a, a, a similar topic yourself in, in a couple of weeks' time. So, so stuff like that brings, keeps you constantly fresh. Constantly learning. Constantly. constantly learning. And that's probably one of the, the, the in addition to the, the money, which I know we're going to come back and talk about somewhere on the line, um, the <coughs> continual nourishment of ideas and thinking and perceptions from various parts of the world is terribly exciting and it does give you a perspective of view of, of some of the things that are happening. You do feel you're in the, a stream of consciousness of what's happening in the world of, uh, world, of, uh, world of commerce. You get to the top of the industry really. You're Chief Operating Officer of Cap Chairman, a tremendously successful global practice. You've just about done everything. How would you measure or how would you classify your career and the successes? What, how would you, what are the measurements of success? Um, and a clue on one of them okay. is cash. Okay. okay. Well, clue on one of them. Clue on one of them is cash. Um, the other one is if you Google Phil Walker Consulting, my thought leadership is still there, and I'm probably most proud of that. 
Um, I wrote That's an article. you writing stuff. Yes, me writing stuff. As I mentioned, you need to have a view on stuff, and my views are still there. Uh, you might find about it, but um, about 15 years ago, I wrote an article on China, um, and um, it's, it's still pertinent. Um, Ten years ago, I wrote an article on Africa about why Africa is the place to get into. I spoke about the GDP of Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa. Uh, the world had been ignoring Africa and focusing on India and China, which is fine. Um, now everybody's tr attempting to jump into uh, Africa for all sorts of reasons, uh, which is interesting. But those articles are still there, and I'm probably most proud of... Thought leadership. Probably most, yeah, probably, probably most proud of those, along with the home in Barbados. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, uh, the small thing. <laughs> so you've done it all in consulting. You decide to go and do something completely different. Yep. What were the thoughts? What were the options? I, I think it's it, one of the things that, that, that happens when you're working in a large uh, uh, corporate is time. I mean, it is full on. I don't know anybody who isn't working hard. I mean, other than inher people with inherited money, um, all of my colleagues are working I'm working seven days a week. I mean, they just are. It's just the nature of 21st century business. It's just you're working hard. And I think just to have the time with family, um, to run projects in Barbados. I'm, I'm in Barbados four times a year, and I, I know it's a place you know. Just the opportunity to do other things is, is, pretty, is really the temptation. But you've, if you don't mind me saying, knowing you a little bit, you're doing a lot of what we call giving back. Yep. Say a little bit about that. So um, one of the things that... Uh, I've been working on for three years. We're building a school in London, uh, building a school in Lambeth for inner city kids, for six formers. Um, and um, we launched, uh, we announced that on, on Monday uh, with Theresa May giving a keynote speech. This is really important. Um, just to digress for a second. Two, please. One in five London school kids can't read properly. Um, if you go to Fulton Young Offenders Prison, 70, and I've been there, not personally living it, but visiting <laughs> it. Just in case I put you off. When consulting goes uh, wrong. <laughs> um, you know, 70% of photo, I mean, they, they can't read. So you can see a direct line between the inability to read and ending up in a, in a penal institution. So this is the greatest city in the world, I think. Um, it is the sixth richest place in the world, as a fact. Yet we've got these pockets of deprivation, one in Stratford, one in uh, Newham, uh, another one in Croydon where the educational attainment is not as good as it could be. This isn't a political point, it's just a fact. And a few business people and I are together trying to do something about this. Um, and it is the right thing to do because we know that educational attainment, as you obviously, because you're sitting here, is the biggest chance in terms of life, life, life success. We still have a situation in London, last point, where if you were born in Kensington and Chelsea as opposed to Stratford, you will live 10 years longer if you're born in Chelsea. Your education achievement, your health, your job prospects. That is not right. And your right. football club. And your football club. <laughs> that is not right. So there are people dotted around London trying to do something about it. And hopefully if we get the education workforce up to speed, they can help pay my pension as well. So tell me about Summerswood. Okay. So Summerswood is, 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 is my, my own small advisory firm. Um, we're fortunate enough, we, um, the phone rings, so Phil, will you come and have a chat? Will you come and talk? I was with a firm in Moorgate this morning giving a presentation, and as I've mentioned, my specialism is to talk about dramatic change, very short, highly intensive projects, which I charge a lot for, and then get the heck out. <laughs> really important to get the heck out, because if you're there for too long, it worries... You'll be the, found out. You'll be found out. <laughs> and it worries the heck out of them. Because if someone's employed you for six months, well, why haven't they employed somebody? And they're leaning on you too. You have not done your job. You have not transferred the skills for them to do it themselves. That is your job. Your job is not to live in their building. Very important. How long have you been doing that? Three years. Where will it all end? What's the end game for you? You've had one of the most successful consulting careers anyone could have had. You're now indulging yourself, advising others, yep. doing some thought leadership still, yep. and giving back. Yep. Where does it all end? Well, when I, when, I, you know, when, I, when I get really good at it, I might write a book, something like Voodoo Economics or something like that, <laughs> in terms of... Uh, that, that, that is on, on the... It's one, of the things I, one of the things I would like to do is just, just capture the journey for anybody who's interested 
uh, in terms of, of and, and just leave that as some type of legacy with a little picture of the school there and a plaque that says, I built this. You I, built this. I was here. You was <laughs> a really fantastic insights for everyone in the room. What would you have done differently and perhaps had a better outcome if you could go back? Okay. Uh, I would have probably have bought more Dell shares. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. The, the, the Dell story, and, and Marcus has heard me eulogize about it. Um, Michael Dell, um, ninth richest guy in the world. 20 years ago, I was with Michael. We had 25 days cash left in the bank. We were going broke. He launched a product called the NL25, which is a slimline notebook. Great product. The only problem is if you put it on a pile of paper, it caught fire. That is not a feature, advantage, or a benefit. <laughs> and, I was running, and I was running the UK at the time, and that's not a good time. And we just put in strategies to save the company. I mean, huge. I mean, we were throwing around company shares like confetti. I, said, I was too angry. Oh, I don't need them. No. And that was a huge mistake. So that's one of the, th that's one of the things I would have right. done definitely. But that is a story in itself, because everybody knows the success. Yes. As you know from your times yes. at M&S and your times at Pepsi, Companies are never a straight trajectory. There are always bows and dips and whatever. That story needs to be told as well, because people keep telling about the, the, the successes. They don't talk about the near-death experiences. And those are important factors where you le probably learn more than at any time in your career. We've seen a lot of consolidation. We have. Booze, who are there forever, have, have just gone. Do you see more consolidation? industry cannibalizing itself? I do. So, so one of the things you'll see within consulting, and, I, and I, I spoke, if you remember, about three elements to it, the pure play, uh, the IT, and the, outsour the outsourcing part. Uh, there are a lot of mid-sized consultants out there who say, we have really good people. In fact, as you're applying for jobs, you'll go on their website. And they'll all say, we have really good people. Fantastic. What a differentiator that is. We have really good people. And they'll say, we do general consulting. If they say, we do general consulting, do not apply. That's not the world that you are moving into, as my learned friend mentioned over here. If you're entering consulting, you really do need to specialize in something. What is it you are good at? And focus on it. Generalism is collapsing. The mid-market is shrinking. Um, Ernst, I help Ern, Ernst & Young are buying firms, they'll buy three or four this year, Deloitte are buying firms, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because the mid-market is, is collapsing. So you're getting the big players dominating for all the reasons we alluded to, the niche players, but that mid-market is collapsing on itself because the market just isn't there. But what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, it's specialize, specialize and be big. Ab absolutely. And the big players have a, have a range of practices, you know, supply chain, strategy, uh, customer relationship management, HR transformation, transformation practice in itself, lean re-engineering. Consulting have got some wonderful phrases that they concoct, lean re-engineering across the enterprise. Great. So students who are sitting here in, in the room who want a career in consulting, what insights and advice would you give them from where they are today to going to that first consulting job. Okay. What's the best use of that okay. time? I, I'll give a little small example, which Marcus and I were joking about the other day. I, I sit on board of a, a London university, and um, a group of MBA students were saying, what advice would you give me to do? And I said, well, I passed a Burger King on the way here. I'd go and work in there for a month. And they laughed as you're laughing. But I was being deadly serious. It is a global brand. You'll understand supply chain. You'll understand customer service. You'll understand manufacturing. It's huge. And, and people who decry working in the likes of, I think somebody was talking about Lidl or M&S or any of the retail firms, you can learn so much with a month or two months in one of those huge firms. I, I, just, think it's, I just think it's awesome, absolutely awesome, how much you can pick up from that type of hands-on experience. Like it a lot. That would, be, that would be one of my bits of advice, to, to get some real work experience before you make the assumption that your intellectual content is so huge that you can uh, advise a CEO of Burberry's <laughs> on how he, it used to be she, 
um, could launch their, 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 their next season's, uh, next season's uh, offering. So you gave us an insight that perhaps uh, the middle market generalists consulting, yep. they're, they're an endangered species. They are. Take yourself 10 years out. What will the world of consulting look like? How will it have changed? How will it have morphed? You'll see the likes of Infosys, Wipro and others from the subcontinent buying up that mid-market. So you'll see firms from various parts of the world um, evident in Europe. So they'll, they'll come because they have rich pickings here in, in, in terms of some of the change. Uh, you'll see that. You'll see firms such as uh, Mu Sigma. Have you heard of Mu Sigma? Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of Mu Sigma? No, okay, so they're a, a company out of Mumbai. Um, they do data analytics. They do data analytics for the top FTSE 100. You've all heard of big data. I'm sure you're all studying and reading about it. They will become one of the biggest firms, I believe, in Europe yeah, over the next 10 years. I mean, they're just cleaning up. They're full of uh, MBA and PhD uh, students, and they do really good stuff. It's not consulting, this data analytics, but in terms of they will enter that, con they will enter that uh, cons con consulting market. Um, and I think, think we'll see further fragmentation, as we alluded to, in terms of what's happening at the high end and what's happening at the low end. Interestingly enough, some of the niche firms that um, René alluded to, there's a great firm in Germany that do global purchasing. They're one of my favorite firms. They do global purchasing. That's what they do. Now, I'm not interested. But they are experts at global purchasing, be it oil, be it corn, be it pork, be it cloth and they charge one of the highest rates in Europe. But that is what they do. They're 200 people, and that's what they do. So hold Global on. purchasing. Isn't that fantastic? So they just niche. Where they do, do they global get their purchasing. people from? Where do they get their people? Well, um, they, they obviously, they, they get their people globally. Their people are terribly bright. They get the right people, and then they train them. They get the right people, okay. and then they train them. So yeah. share with me the right people. Okay, okay. So the right people, the intellectual rigor, um, again, if it was me, that, that little bit of, I've run a business and I've lived a bit in the, I've lived a bit in, in, in the world of war. Intellectually curious, intellectually curious, ability to travel, and great with people and, 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 and brilliant at communication. Those are the right people, those are the attributes. Have you noticed, when you meet the people at the top of their profession, they make the most complex things seem so simple, so straightforward. And if you notice one of the things that you've heard from Phil consistently all the way through, everything he says is simple and straightforward. Everyone in the room understood everything he said. That's a hell of a gift. And did you also notice that he shared everything? Didn't duck a question. Shared the good things and the bad things. And he also empathised with where you are. So everything he said, he put it in a place in a position that it was helpful to you. That's why he's one of the best consultants I've ever met. Also, one of the best leaders I've ever met. And he says, I've got people skills. I think you've just seen, experience what he means by people skills. Please, 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 please. Put your hands together. Give Phil a fantastic round of applause. Well, what can I say? Even better than I thought he was going to be. Humility, courage, vision, passion, but most of all, authenticity. I hope you've taken away the lesson. The best person you can be is you. Never pretend to be anyone else, just be you. The world changes for people who are prepared to change. Phil changed. <laughs>